Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, and we're back in the studio today. Um, I've been at the IUCN where I ran into an old friend from uh, Permaculture Adventures, Roberto, <laughs> Roberto Perez Rivero. And I said, well, come on down on the show. So here he is. Um, Roberto is um, uh, famous um, in large part because he did he directed produced this movie. He's featured on it. <laughs> or you're featured on it. Um, the power of community. How Cuba survived peak oil. That came out in 2006. And Perfect. You were here a few years ago, and we did some showings of it actually. Yeah. And then um, a uh, rowdy bunch of of people from Hawaii, ton of us descended upon Cuba um, at uh, Roberto's invitation to attend the International Purple Culture Conversions in um, 2013. So um, I just, since we're here and, and we had that amazing uh, two-week experience um, traveling around Cuba, which is a lot like Hawaii in a lot of, um, cl climatically. Yeah, it's the same uh, latitude. And we're, we're influenced uh, by the, the climate and the ocean and, and, and the tropics, yeah. So there were a lot of lessons, I felt, that were very good for us from Hawaii. Um, so let's have some pictures and talk about those features in it that we saw in Cuba. Uh, well, here's our rowdy bunch. Um, Think Tech uh, fans will uh, recognize Hunter Hevelin uh, on the left, who used to be the coast of Sustain Hawaii. And um, so these are all pretty much people who are active in agriculture in Hawaii to this day. And on the right, Matt Lynch, who's head of UH Sustainability. So while we were there, we were working hard and playing hard. <laughs> and um, not just permaculture in the ag sense, but we learned about how permaculture uh, was also a way of doing businesses. And, um, we visited a place that had this, um, can you talk about it? Yes, this is a basically <clears throat> one of the people that passed uh, the permaculture design certification. And in another photo we'll see that <clears throat> he was a, having a garden along that road that has a slope and he, will, he realized that he was in the position to collect, a, not this one, a lot of water. So basically what he came with the idea of uh, have uh, something that he called an eco, eco car washing. So basically, he collect he collect the rainwater and, and filter it, and this is the water that is being used in the in the car wash the that, that you sense. saw in that photo. And basically, the water that is used there is also filtered in a fat trap and with some natural uh, filters. And it, it can be reused in the car washing, and eventually it can also be used like to irrigate some fruit trees or trees, not vegetables. Trees, not vegetables, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that the quality is good, but that's what he does. Yeah. So th that's, um, so here we can see how. Exactly. Yeah, I also thought this, this fencing was fantastic. It's a living fence, but in the distance we see that the car wash and then the trees on the side, the bananas that are then watered by the gray water of the car wash? Exactly. Uh, he can, uh, the, uh, as you can see where the people are, there is a, like a slope and all the water goes into uh, his garden. And this is a, an euph euphorbia. It's a special, it's not a cactus, but it's on, on the family of the succulents that they have a very powerful latex also. So it's, it's a perfect for fencing because it doesn't require a lot of water. And you can see So by how latex, you mean the sap is very... Uh, acidic, yeah, yeah okay. it's, it's aggressive. Wow. <laughs> and you can see how he uh, used all the rocks that he collected from the soil to make like sort of terracing or like uh, erosion preventing walls. So he can like level the sites and he can produce a different type of vegetables. Because in his house, that is just uh, back there, and when you see the bananas and plantain trees, in the back, there are orchards in the back. Or this is in the famous town of Kohima, which is famous because Ernest Hemingway lived there for many, many years, and his boat it used to be anchored there too. Yeah, but we, we drove by the, the place he stayed? Or yeah, the, yeah, the place he stayed and his favorite restaurant, La Terraza. Yeah. So um, one of the other things that um, we did was um, see how um, 
people in in the U.S. of course think about permaculture more in terms of ho home gardens mostly. Yeah. But w what was really great was to see in Cuba how it, there were larger both community gardens and larger commercial gardens. And we have um, we have some pictures of those, um, like the suburban farm, um, which was just uh, this was just outside Havana, right? Yeah. This is a, a, a typical operation that you would see in the urban part of Cuba. It's called organoponico. It comes from a mix of hydroponic, but with organic matter. And these you will see it like in in different places in the city. Now they are more in the they're also in the suburban parts. So basically, uh, when you uh, apply the permaculture principles and, and ethical values to any sort of like agricultural operation, you will get extra, um, I don't like the word yield, but <laughs> benefits and products that are good for the nature, good for the people, uh, and good for the plants itself. And, and that's basically some of the work that we have been doing uh, with uh, spreading the permaculture in Cuba is that once the people learn their principles, they can apply in broad acre, like, I mean, in a big farm, or you can apply in a small community garden or in one of these organic uh, vegetable operations. Okay, so you, you mentioned hydroponic, but it's not grown, they're not grown in water, they're grown in... Yes, and, and this is part of a funny story. The name Organoponico came because in the 90s, in the city of Havana, they were like maybe 10, 12, I don't recall, uh, hydroponics. Hydroponics is an operation when you need a lot of like chemical products to work as nutrient solutions for the plants. Of course, when we run out of money, we run out of nutrient solutions. And somebody have the brilliant idea to dig all the sand from this hydroponic, put compost, organic matter, organoponico. Oh. Organoponic, intensive organic production. In California, they would use the word maybe biointensive, using the ginger ones. Like, but basically, this was like a part of the massive transformation of Cuban agriculture, from a conventional to like more based on, on natural. I won't say organic because it's a lot more than that. It's low emission, it's low energy, it's socially fair, uh, and chemically free. So, I, I know that the organic means all of that, but I like to make well, that it's not necessarily only chemical free a production. And especially since organic doesn't, it just means fossil fuel free. Exactly. Um, but you got, yours is actually based a lot on, on vermicast, right? On worms. Vermicast. I've never seen these amazing, huge. Biofertilizers. And even, if you, you, you will see, you will see a lot of tractors and a lot of, uh, on the contrary, there are oxen, and there is just also a lot of people working. Working hard, but in Cuba, the difference is that you can have more people in, in, in one acre, you know? Like, so there is one operation that I remember a lot because they, they, there's like 100 people operating 11 hectares. And some people that visit from the US and from other countries say, oh, this is very labor intense. What, what's wrong with, a hundred families eating and having a good job. Why, why have to be only one tractor and somebody really struggling there, compacting the soil, damaging the plants? But it's just different. I'm just it's explaining just how it works. And it there. was lovely. And I remember we visited one outside of Havana, and one of the principals of the operation had been a physician, and she decided she would rather be a farmer. Exactly. Uh, many people uh, that they were, you know, drivers or doctors, lawyers, or, you know, it, it was different. They decided to switch. And they decided to switch at, at a certain point in time. This was at that... In the 90s. In the 90s, 90s when, they, when the Soviets left exactly. abruptly. Exactly. There was so. no food in the country. And some people started, like, to self-sustain the family. So basically producing some food in their patios or raising some, you know, chickens and things like that. And then they just realized that it was fun and then they can make money of it, and then they like it. So that's why the, now we have almost half a million people doing some forms of urban agriculture, permaculture or not. We try to infect the permaculture bug in all of them. 
Uh, here's a great example of that. So there's, exactly. um, uh, I would love to see uh, urban community gardens like that here. Um, they're, um, ours typically, everybody has their own little, um, love men, yeah. <laughs> their little, whatever it is, 10 by 10. But uh, the way it's done here, more, I don't know how you uh, guys make it work so that everybody feels like they're getting their fair share, but it seems to work. Basically, the word that people were sharing is not that my little square here and your little square there, because in that way you spend a lot of space on, you know, and more pipes. There was only probably everybody was sharing one pipe for the water or, or buckets. So the people design in a different way. They try to optimize the space and then they share the food according to the number of hours that they were doing in the garden. More hours you do, you get more food. That was in the very beginning. Then, uh, when the permaculture techniques were introduced, they just realized in nature they are not square ends, the square angles. So why making boring, long and narrow pathways? And that's when you're going to see all of these circular uh, oval patterns that are very uh, common in permaculture, but not very common in conventional agriculture operations. And they look nice. They are gorgeous. They, I just, I still have visions of the permaculture gardens in Cuba. Last week on my show, I had two agroforestry um, practitioners from Hawaii Island here, and they showed pictures of their um, agroforest um, plots. Uh, and there's, uh, I mean, agroforestry is one of the tools of, of permaculture, yeah. just to um, kind of explain that to people who might have seen last week's show. But um, uh, this is a way to do planting of crops, but have it be um, uh, quick crops, but have it be accessible, easy to maintain, not for humans, not for machines. That's exactly. Uh, basically, the plants uh, and animals that, that we eat and they taste the best are not exactly the ones that have been produced massively because those ones, they they ripe late, they have hard skins because they need to be transported from long distance. But what do we want is plants that not all the fruits ripe at the same time. I want two today, two tomorrow, and that they taste very good and the skin is not that hard. So those varieties can grow so much better with this different space. Uh, we call it microclimates. So maybe you don't have a swamp in your house but you can create one microclimate and one corner of your garden receive more water because the water accumulates there so then you plant your taro or your water loving plants there and then in another little corner of your garden that is drier you plant other crops so that's basically the permaculture trying to maximize the habitats okay Beautiful. Um, we, uh, you are here this time because of the IUCN happening at the convention center, and we're going to take a short break and come back and talk about what's what's new and what's happening at the IUCN. That can be great. This is the other part of my big love. <laughs> For a very healthy summer, watch Viva Hawaii. We're giving you the best tips and with our best health coach here. So, Viva Health Coach. Viva la comida saludable. Hi, my name is Justine Spiritu. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson. Every Thursday at 4 p.m., we host the Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. This is the place you can come to for insight on the perspective and history and passions of Hawaii's farmers and all folks involved in Hawaii's local food system. What kind of folks do we have on? So we have everyone from local farmers, we have foodies, chefs, we also have journalists, uh, researchers, anyone who's actually working to help make Hawaii's local food system that much better. So join us every Thursday and uh, tweet in to us and ask us some questions and leave your comments as well. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Kawe Lucas here on Think Tech Hawaii with Hawaii is my mainland this week. I have Roberto Perez Rivero from Cuba, and he is a permaculturist and an educator in all things um, agriculture and environmental. Um, he's been with the F I'm going to do the acronym of it, FANJ.org. 
Um, for some 20 years, it's a nonprofit organization in Cuba that um, teaches uh, about uh, the environment and climate change and all those really important things. So um, you're here with uh, the Foundation Antonio Nunes. Yeah. And um, what are you doing at the IUCN? And basically, apart from being in the organizations that in the early 90s hosted the small group of Cubans and Australians that were bringing the permaculture, the, the Foundation for Nature and Humanity, it's a, an environmental grassroots organization. We don't have a membership, but basically we work with Cuban communities in order to bring the different dimensions of sustainability. One, we have been talking in the first part of the show, that is basically food security and healthy ways of, of grow of agriculture. And the other one is basically to try to preserve the base of the ecosystems of the country. And in, in that work, we, ha we became members of IUCN, the International Union for Nature Conservancy, in 2004, and have been teamed with other organizations in the island Caribbean in order to preserve uh, the best of the biodiversity, but also in order to bring a better quality of life and sustainable practices onto the communities that are near those very sensitive ecosystems. And in this case, what we are bringing to the World Congress uh, here in Hawaii, and thank you for the hospitality, uh, because it's, it's been great so far. In, the, in these two days, it's, it's great a uh, place, a very unique place to celebrate one of these Congress. What we're bringing is a documentation of the work that we have been doing uh, with these ecosystems and these communities in the coastal and in the mountains in order to preserve as much as possible for, from the impacts of climate change. The funny thing is that what we bring is um, uh, images, like photos and videos in 3D. What do so you mean? <laughs> basically, it's that a bunch of people have been working very, very hard in order to try to film of this uh, very uh, difficult to access uh, spaces of Cuba in order to show in 3D, very high, high quality, like the, the little wonders of the Cuban biodiversity, but also the work that those communities and we have been very proud and humbly facilitating uh, in different places of Cuba in order to minimize the impacts of the climate change. So um, we talked a little uh, about how things are in Cuba with re uh, respect to climate change. What are the most, what are the most deeply felt uh, climate impacts? First, uh, we believe in climate change. And it doesn't matter what we believe, but I know that is a contentious issue in the U.S. And climate change is in our door. It's happening in the Caribbean. We're feeling it. And it's uh, bringing uh, negative impacts in that. In the terms of the island Caribbean, the main impacts are a alternation of droughts or flash floods because it rains out of season and then it doesn't rain in a couple of years. And there is also the elevation of the temperature of the Caribbean Sea, which have uh, two among all the problems. One, the potential coral bleaching that is happening in, in many places in the Caribbean. Fortunately, not so much in Cuba. Uh, and you know, it's worth saying why. Why, why are the Cum Cuban reefs doing There okay? are different explanations for that, but in those areas, there is not so much pollution, not, not so much sedimentation and sun and seal going into the coral so they can respond better to the conditions of high temperature. This okay, is so they're also more, they're a contentious issue, but they, they can resist better than that. And, you know, the way that the currents work uh, and the depths of the places. But this is something that we have to take in account when we, we measure the temperature in centigrade. You know, after a, anything over 23 degrees is very potentially very bad for the Caribbean. And so they're... But there is it's something that is happening. The other thing is that the hotter the water of the Caribbean is, the hurricanes and cyclones that forms there, they are more intense. So I think it's important to clarify that. The number of hurricanes per year, most of the scientists don't think is affected by climate change, but other uh, meteorological phenomena. But they, 
intensity, the heavy intensity of some of the hurricanes, Katrina style, that we, we see in the Caribbean are for sure the raise of the temperature of the water. The other um, classic that everybody's expecting is on the raise of the level of the ocean. But we have to take in account that when the sea level raise, there is a lot happening on the ground because there is something called the saline wedge. So it's, it's that the salty water will go inland and with damage into soils, it can be arable land or it can be other coastal ecosystems that they get salinated. So this is uh, something that is happening and only like uh, trying to restore the native coastal ecosystems like mangroves and sea grasses and preserving the, the health of the coral reef because they make a, a system together will increase what scientists call resilience of the ecosystem in order to resist those impacts and not die and not making like big losses. And of course, you know, all of these uh, touristic areas that are in the coastal systems, they will be in peril because of the, you know, the wave, the winds, and, and some of those things. These are, in a nutshell, there are so many things that cannot be predicted that we just see now, but this is uh, the work that we do. So you, you talked about how the, I hadn't heard of this before, the, that salt water that it, um, for every inch that it, the sea level comes up, so it contaminates the soil up to four yes, kilometers because, inland. Yes, you're totally right. Wow. It's a little bit complex, but you have a very low coast, for example. It can be a swamp, it can be a low coast. And then what happens in, in that, under that area is it's that interaction where there is a layer of fresh water on top and salt water on the bottom. When the layer of fresh water gets thinner and thinner and thinner mm. because we overuse that water because the sea level is rising, yeah. then this wedge goes inland in the aquifer. And the moment that the, the fresh water disappears and the salt water touch the soil, it gets salinated. Uh, okay. And that's very bad for the crops, very bad for some plants. Fortunately, mangrove trees can resist that. Uh, coconut trees, at, in seasons, if they get access to fresh water, they can also do well. But most of the plants, in saline conditions, they cannot survive. And it's very bad. So this is something that unfortunately is happening. We cannot deny that, and we need to prepare for that. Well, I can't, um, I can't not ask because of the um, recent political changes. Um, can you talk about that a little? Um, how how has that affected um, life in Cuba? That there, our countries are now uh, officially speaking to each other. Yeah. Uh, how's it? How's it changed? I think that there is uh, something very good. One of the last uh, dinosaurs of Cold War. <laughs> Finally, came down, we're talking, and we're neighbors. We are both sides of the Florida Strait. We have access to the Gulf of Mexico, along with Mexico. And at least on the environmental issues, there is a lot to talk about. Uh, disaster reduction, risk reductions. And I think that that is happening, like the, the relevant organizations of both countries on the government level and in non-government level are having dialogue on that. In the terms of the lifting of some of the restrictions of the embargo that we call blockade, some of them they are still in place because it took 50 years to put it the way it is. It would take some years to eliminate. But without any doubt, there have been some lifting of restrictions. Like last week, there will be regular flights between the two countries, and there's like you know some business together. Um, what about the internet? Uh, the, in the case of the internet, uh, the cave, the Cuba was joined to the bourbon of optic fibers by a cable that came from Venezuela. So they, there are there is also the possibility to make use some of the U.S. cables on the that goes on the water and that, but not that I know that hasn't happened yet. But I know that several telephone companies are making agreements for roaming text messages that was like very difficult. And of course, you know, there are a lot of Cuban families uh, that live in Florida and in the U.S. also, and there will be agreements for, you know, calling uh, and, and that things. The access of the internet have been increasing the country. I don't have that data to tell you, but yeah. there are 
Wi-Fi areas in all the cities of the country where people just can go with the phone and connect. Wow, that's a so huge that, difference from total just, difference. <laughs> Before from just three Before it was dialogue, <laughs> very slow, very <laughs> narrow bandwidth. I know it can be better, but you know, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a it's process. Great. It's a process. And basically, what many people are waiting for, it will be a big wave of tourists from U.S. to Cuba. Uh, so far, there are like 12 different uh, allowed uh, um, occupations or ways that you can go to Cuba. But still, you know, there are some restrictions on that. But without any doubt, it has been increasing the number of U.S. citizens visiting Cuba for different reasons. Still, it's not like uh, millions, but it can potentially be. So I think that the country needs to prepare for that in order to uh, protect the, um, the heritage, the natural heritage, talking yes. about biodiversity because... A and your natural, I mean, it's a uh, beautiful country. That's size. one thing. Yeah. And also try to, uh, to make a, a tourism that is more ethical and linked to the values of, of the Cubans, you know, like the music, the culture, uh, the landscapes, uh, the food, why not, the rum, and, th and not, you know, a very uh, aseptic international touristy Great. that you can see in Cancun. Keep it, yeah, you know, keep it, part. keep it Cuban. But it's a challenge. Yeah, it's, I'm it's sure a it's a ch In our last, um, in our last minute or so, um, can you talk about when your, um, uh, production is at the IUCN? Yes, it's so a, it's a social people. event in a very awkward time, 7.30 on the Sunday 4th of September, the room 3.1C. 7.30 p.m. Yeah, tonight, yeah. I hope they... At uh, in, in C, 3.1C? 3.1.6C, room. Okay, at, at, this is at the convention center. At the convention center. And this will be the three-dimensional. Exactly, Cuba uh, in 3D. Cuba in 3D. It sounds very intriguing. I'm definitely going to be there. And um, perhaps you can um, say something in Spanish because there's a lot of Spanish people going to it. And okay. um, let them know. Eh, quiero darle las gracias por esta oportunidad de hablar eh, de Cuba aquí en un lugar tan cercano a nosotros como Hawái y terminar con una de las contribuciones más grandes que yo pienso que se ha hecho en Cuba a la biodiversidad. Y es que en 1959 solo había 11% de cobertura de bosques. Y este año llegamos al 30,6%. O sea, lejos de deforestar, hemos ido reforestando en 50 años eh, y más de duplicar eh, la cantidad de bosques en Cuba. Quisiera dejarlo ahí y, y darle las gracias por esta oportunidad. Oh, thank you, Roberto. It's so good to see you again. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> we'll have to go visit some more farms. Oh, yeah. Uh, I will be after the event here with Jesus. He will take me.